Uh, next up, we have David Vertanian sharing his presentation from stellar death to chemical rebirth. Uh, so David is, um, I was told to say, David is a man of simple interests. He enjoys cooking and black metal. In his spare time, he is an astrophysics PhD candidate who studies the explosive death of stars as supernovae, the, the subject of today's performance. Please welcome David to the stage. Hello, I am David Bartanian, and I am an astrophysicist mortician. <laughs> Together with my advisor, Dr. Adam Burroughs, I study dead stars. And I could tell you about the work I do, but I'd much rather show you. <laughs> Stars live and stars die. Massive stars live fast and die young, ending their lives catastrophically in a magnificent explosion that for a few brief seconds outshines the universe. It is here in the throes of death that stars fertilize the void of the universe with the elements needed for life to form. These elements end up in new stars, like our sun, in solar systems, in new planets, like our Earth, and ultimately, in us. The world outside these walls, the room we sit in, down to us, the iron in our blood cells, the calcium in our bones, the oxygen in our lungs, all was forged billions of years ago and many light years away in the hot, dense furnaces of massive stars. Stars more than 10 times the size of our sun. And like many of us, stars spend their lives in a state of anxiety, in a constant struggle, a tug of war between gravity and pressure. Gravity acts to compress the star inward, while the outward force of pressure, powered by nuclear fusion in the star's core, prevents collapse. It is in this process of nuclear fusion that atoms in a constant state of motion collide and combine to form heavier and heavier elements, from hydrogen to helium, carbon, oxygen, silicon, iron. But stars eventually exhaust their atomic fuel. And as with humans, so with stars, gravity wins. After burning bright for millions of years, the star collapses in on itself in a matter of seconds faster than your typical New Jersey driver. <laughs> and while the outer envelope of the star is still spellbound by gravity, blissfully falling inward, the inner core overshoots in its collapse. The nuclear forces have become repulsive in the tightly bound core, and it bounces forcefully back out, driving a shock that pummels into the outer layers of the star and begins to expand outward and outward into ultimately, it runs out of speed and stalls. The star suffocates its own explosion. Or not. Hold on, let's rewind that last bit. <laughs> For the longest time, astrophysicists have struggled to explain how stars explode. But our understanding of both atomic physics and stellar structure was incomplete. And so for over half a century, even our best models have failed to explain what our naked eyes can see. Until now. And we're going to explore our cosmological origins on this episode of Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> So how do you explode a star? The answer lies with a physical discovery in the last century. Neutrinos. Neutrinos are particles without any electric charge, hence neutral, and are very tiny, hence the eno, to form neutrino. And they interact only very weakly with the atoms of the universe. Billions of neutrinos through us every second, and yet, over a lifetime, only about a hundred will ever actually collide with the atoms in our body. 
So why do neutrinos matter? When a massive star collapses, only a fraction of a percent of its energy is radiated in light we see. Rather, most of its gravitational energy is released in neutrinos, and most neutrinos stream right through the star. This is why explosions fail. Neutrinos carry away all the energy, and the growing shock runs out of steam. The trick to getting a star to explode is to get just enough neutrinos colliding on their way out with the atoms in the star, like billiard balls. Neutrinos heat and energize the atoms in the star of shock, transforming the shock into a supernova. We've observed supernovae for millennia. We've studied them for the last century and have known about the neutrino mechanism for more than a few decades. And for decades, the field has lacked high fidelity models that not only explode, but explode robustly. My work addresses this long-standing problem. I've identified two key details neglected in earlier simulations necessary to transform failed explosions into some of the first successful supernovae models. And for your model to explode a star, first treat a small scale neutrino physics properly. As a massive star collapses, its core, which is now entirely made of neutrons, becomes extremely hot and extraordinarily dense. Denser than most astrophysicists. And the nuclear physics in these extreme environments is not perfectly understood. But we now know that neutrons in such exotic environments show collective behavior. As neutrons cluster together, neutrinos are less likely to hit them. Rather, they escape more easily, causing the star's core to lose energy and shrink even more to gravity, getting buried even deeper. But as the core shrinks, it gets hotter. Neutrinos too get hotter and now collide even more energetically with the atoms in the star of shock just outside the core. Neutrinos harvest energy from gravity and transfer it to the shock, reviving the shock <coughs> into an explosion. You have a give and take. You lose neutrinos from the star's core, but you more than gain them back in the shock just outside. And because you have many bodies interacting in the star's core, this effect is creatively called the many body effect. And it was not understood in the context of supernovae until just a few years ago, when we first modeled it in our simulations. It's a small effect, but it shows how close our older models were to explosion and how critical it is to nail down the physics correctly. But we don't expect all stars to explode. And that brings us to our second ingredient. We have to be prudent in identifying which stars do explode. You may think that all lighter stars explode, or perhaps all heavier stars. You'd all be wrong. It's not the size of the star that matters, but what it's made of. Recall that as a star burns fuel and ages, it produces heavy and heavier elements. It becomes structured like a layered onion. Each layer, a different element, from hydrogen outside to helium, carbon, oxygen, silicon, down to iron in the star's core. And in this structure are two important elements formed in adjacent layers, silicon and oxygen. Stars that have a dense silicon layer and a weak oxygen layer are more likely to explode. These layers fall in as the star is collapsing and accrete onto the star's shock. Silicon is located deep inside the star and accretes early before the shock runs out of steam. The shock then cannibalizes the dense silicon layer for energetic neutrinos and is revitalized. It then easily dispels the tenuous oxygen layer in its way and grows into a full-blown explosion. The sharp silicon to oxygen transition is a Goldilocks zone for stellar explosion. We don't understand why some stars have a sharp silicon to oxygen transition. 
perhaps not all massive stars are destined to explode. Perhaps we are still missing an important piece. And that brings us to our final ingredient, because sometimes you need a little something extra. In addition to the small scale microphysics of the star's core, we also study the large scale macrophysical behavior of stars. Stars rotate and can have large magnetic fields. Many stars are found in binaries or triplets. Our lone sun is an outlier. The inner depths of stars are in great turmoil, boiling and bubbling in turbulent convection. And all these factors are still poorly understood. But we found that even these small changes can evolve a failed model into a successful explosion. And we've studied all these ingredients in our simulations, running them on sprawling supercomputers using tens of thousands of processors nonstop for a month in this novel system. And there's still much work to be done. But we now understand that a delicate dance between the traditional physics of the star core and the structure of the star determine if and how the star explodes. We have transitioned from an era where our model would comprehensively fail to an era where we can consistently produce successful stellar explosions simply by doing the details right. And these explosions birth the iron in our blood cells, the calcium in our bones, the oxygen in our lungs, down to the carbon in the beers you'll inevitably be drinking later tonight. All formed in the hot, dense furnaces of massive stars. Stars more than 10 times the size of our sun. And it only takes a single explosion to produce enough carbon to create not one, not 10, not a hundred, but a hundred thousand Earths, or a whole lot of beer. <laughs> and out of these elements form new solar systems, new stars, new planets, new life. My thesis research in astrophysics here at Princeton brings us one step closer to the goal of understanding the nature of supernovae, and ultimately, the nature of our origin. Thank you very much.